So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for making us part of your day. It means a lot to me. I know that all of you are living busy lives, and the fact you've tuned in today means a lot. Uh, but uh, I also bring to you on a weekly basis amazing people, and today is no exception. It's a pleasure to have in the studio today uh, Dr. Reem Kabara. She's a pediatric dentist. We're going to talk about her, at, uh, introduce her in a second, but uh, thank you for being here. If you like what you hear, uh, pass it on to your friends, relatives. We're building an audience, and uh, we want to, people to listen to the amazing people that I bring you bring before you on a weekly basis. So today, it's a pleasure to welcome to the Hamilton Review, Dr. Reem Kabara. She's a dentist, and uh, Reem, thanks for being here. Dr. Bob, it's my pleasure. I am just thrilled. And um, I want to start by saying, by bringing back a beautiful memory to the first day I met you. And that was the day my daughter, Isabel, was born. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, a first-time mom uh, right after birth. And we were scheduled to meet another lovely person on your team. But due to a switch, we got to meet you. And... The minute you walked in and the minute you held my daughter in that infamous Hamilton hold, <laughs> um, I felt home. I felt home and I felt uh, the enthusiasm that is with you every day. I think with probably every infant you meet. Isn't that true? Actually, it is true. I, yeah. I have to say that I, I always tell people that the day I, I lose the, the wow, the, yeah. that awe, of newborns, uh, of course, and that was when I met you. And I actually, I'm sorry, I don't remember that moment in time. Uh, no it's more, you probably remember that. It, it, I, it was amazing. It but, was amazing. But I do have, uh, listen, um, children are amazing. And I, I always walk in, and every time I see a new baby, I, first of all, I think it's amazing. They were a day before they were inside of your body. Yes. And that, that to me is always a, a an incredible phenomenon. Uh, birth itself is an amazing uh, thing. And so you're right. I do have that sense of, of delight and joy, and I'm glad that you felt that. It was continuous. Every time we came to the practice, um, you know, I felt home. I felt the love in your heart, the love in your family, um, you know, your beautiful personal family, and, and definitely lovely Dr. Salyer, who continues to practice with you. Um, my every, daughter, everything, yes. yeah. everything I, I sensed was just about home and that felt so good. So I knew we were always in the right place. Thank you, Reem. That's very, those are very <laughs> kind words. So you're, you're jumping ahead a little bit. I yes. want to say, I, I usually have my guests talk about themselves, well, we but, do and, that. and I want to, I'm going to back you up a little bit and mm -hmm. I'm going to. Uh, have you introduced yourself to my audience uh, in terms of who you are, where you grew up? And uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, and you can just kind of tell a little bit about your, who you are as a person. Well, I was born and raised overseas. I grew up in Damascus, Syria, in the Middle East, um, to a Syrian-Lebanese father and an American mother. Um, my father met my mother in the States. He was studying in the United States as she was in college, and they continued that uh, course of studies over several years, um, returned to the Middle East and had me and my siblings. And um, I grew up in a very interesting cocoon of love, um, very multicultural, um, beautiful community yeah. of you know, local Syrian families, in addition to families who were like me, who had a foreign mother from another country, whether that was the United States or a European country, um, and also the richness of a very ancient culture, a yeah. continuously inhabited place for over 5,000 years. Um, Damascus, that, that, you're talking about yes, Damascus. the city of Damascus yeah. is... is um, a very unique place, and uh, you sense that. You take that in as a child on maybe a subconscious level. Yeah. There's just um, a lot of time, a lot of um, history, and a lot of civilizations. I think that's that probably what stood out for me the most, civilizations. And it always intrigued me. 
Yeah. Um, you know, the city itself um, has beautiful historic sites. Uh, something else that really rang true in my soul was uh, the fact that the three major religions, you know, were part sure. of that in the ancient city, all side by side. Um, so, you know, despite different political situations and, you know, different types of upheavals, I think that essence is, is what I, I really valued and, and took with me wherever I went, you know, in that sense of home that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, it also helped me become a citizen of the world, if you will, because, um, you know, finding love in um, so many, in, in the same way, yet in so many different facets. Um, my best friend's mother was German, you know, and we, we got introduced to all of that beautiful culture that she was bringing along. Sure. Uh, Christmas time was extra special because we exchanged Christmas cookies. And every family had their own tradition. You know, the women from the United States were from all over the United States. My mother, you know, grew up in Chicago. Our, our other friends, you know, were West Coast. We had East Coast people. We had people from the South of the United States. So I think that that type of, of wealth um, in humanity um, is probably, you know, the biggest gift that I really treasure. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and also the, the local uh, community as well. We had a, a Muslim community. Um, I went to local schools. My mother was a school teacher at the in international school, but my siblings and I uh, grew up learning Arabic as a first language and learning English at home as a second language sure. um, with some exposure to the French language as well. Amazing. Amazing. Very, you know, international type of community. And then you, so your, your father was over here. What did your father do? Uh, my father holds a PhD in economics, and um, my family history in Syria was uh, uh, very active in terms of uh, being uh, in the forefront of the community. Um, uh, my grandfather was a physician who started um, one of he was one of the founders uh, with a group of wonderful other doctors of the Red Crescent. Um, he, he, of the Red of Crescent. The Red Crescent uh, he yes. was one of the founders of Yes, he was a, with his uncle as well. Um, so the, his, just friends, just so you know, there is a, obviously a Red Cross, mm -hmm. uh, which everyone knows internationally, International Red Cross, which is an organization which obviously meets uh, needs, but there's also a thing called the Red Crescent, which is more of an Islamic yes. um, organization. So mm -hmm. your your grandfather yes. was Yes, amazing. he was an ophthalmologist trained in Paris. Okay. And... Um, you know, went back to um, start uh, a practice and a life and teamed up with many of the physician peers that were in different specialties yeah. and remained close friends, you know, over generations. Um, his brother was um, uh, politically active and he uh, had a newspaper. He ran a newspaper. Um, my grandfather's sister was the first woman to graduate from law school uh, in, from Damascus University. Um, very pioneering in that respect. And she also held um, a dual um, uh, certificate in Arabic literature. Uh, so, you know, the education was very valued in my family yeah. and, and service was very valued. Um, and human relations, very yeah. valued. So this was the time of Assad. This was the, the, the older Assad, yes. not the younger Assad. Indeed. So the younger Assad is, of course, a... Uh, an ophthalmologist as well, yes, as you well yes, know. Yes. Uh, but uh, so that would have been in the 1980s. Is that correct? Yes. Or 80s. Correct. Okay. Very correct. good. Uh, and then you left. You left as a young woman. You left Syria. Why did you leave? Well, um, you know, following in the footsteps of um, previous generations, it was really educational. That was the main goal. It was educational. Um, you know, my family. Uh, definitely encouraged me, but it was a little bit of um, a, a more challenging route for me than it was for my older brother. Um, you know, they, coming from a small community, they wanted me protected and safe, and I wanted to explore the world. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I had this longing to spread my wings and, and find my way independently. <clears throat> that was a big thing for me. Um, and it was, it's so interesting because I 
remember watching a show on TV, and, and it, we had very limited exposure to Western shows, but one of them was the Remington Steel show. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it, it was it was actually took place in Los Angeles. And, right. and I remember, you know, the beautiful, the, the filming of it and the ocean. And I was a child and I asked my mom, where is this place? <laughs> Where is this place? And, and she explained the West Coast, you know, and we, I didn't know about the West Coast because sure. we used to visit the, mid, the Midwest. Right. Um, and I thought, what a beautiful place. And so it, it was kind of a dream come true to end up matching at USC and, and finishing my residency in pediatric dentistry there. Um, yeah. So where do you, okay, so you, you came here when you were in your early 20s mm -hmm. to the U.S. Uh, where did you do your undergraduate and dental school? Uh, that was in Damascus University in Syria, and that was um, a little bit before private colleges uh, started there. That was a newer concept. Um, we went through a rigorous exam in 12th grade, yeah. and it's basically an exam that determines what you're going to do for the rest of your life. <laughs> so um, you decide. Which is, which is interesting. Okay, so you're in 12th grade, you're mm -hmm. in high school, you're in 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And I and you told me that this exam is over a period of several days. It is, yes. And and the people who do well, uh, what do they do? Well, you get choices. You know, the the, the higher you score, the more choices you get. Um, you have to score a certain amount of points to be eligible to enter into medicine dentistry. Um, you know, and, and then the, you kind of go down the list and you, if you don't score very high, the, let's just say the choices get a little more limited and we, we really didn't have a huge amount to begin with. <laughs> so many people do end up repeating this year of their life, you know, so that they can do better, score higher. So it does, it, it really kind of ruled, um, family life for that year. And, um, you know, a, a, a big family challenge if they had, uh, one of their, kids going through this baccalaureate exam, as it's called. Yeah. Um, things have softened up a lot. And, uh, you know, there are other options. There are private universities now. So it's a little different. But um, I knew I wanted to be, you know, in the health field. I knew that. And um, I always enjoyed children. I guess my mother being a school teacher and just my fascination with youngsters and learning. Yeah. Um, I think pediatric dentistry tied all of that together. Um, I spoke to you about my love of art, design, and, and architecture, and I think yeah. uh, that whole 3D dimension comes in nicely, uh, you know, ties in nicely with pediatric, uh, well, with dentistry in general. Uh, so it, it kind of makes sense now how everything came together. You know, when you're going through things, you don't quite, um, you know, say, oh, well, is this, you know, exactly where I need to be? But with time, you fine tune, and, and when you trust, things make sense. I mean, when you're in 12th grade, you're what, 18, 17, 18 years of age. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that if you actually, and, and I do this all the time, I, I talk to my 17, 18 year, old, 18 year old kids who are on their way to college, and I say, what do you want to do? And I will tell you the vast majority of these kids, and, and, and a no no shame here, is they go, I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out when I get to college. Yeah. But to actually, um, in, in that situation, you were like being called upon to make some major decisions as a young young person, really. True. But you knew that you wanted to go into, into something in medicine, something yes. with kids. Yes. And you ended up in dentistry. I ended up in dentistry. I wanted to do medicine and be like you, Dr. Bob. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, it was um, very close, but uh, the choice was uh, made by points, <laughs> let's just say that, uh, to go to dental school. Yeah, and, uh, you and so know, you went to dental school in de yes, dental school in, yes, in Damascus. Yes, I went to dental school in Damascus, and I still have wonderful friends who attended school with me all over the world. Uh, everybody's kind of scattered in in one place or another. Um, but again, it was um, it was a great experience. It's a very compacted program. It was a five year program, um, and you know, wonderful professors, um, many who were educated abroad. Um, one of the key characters in my life uh, was Dr. Issam Shaban, who was um, dean of the school. Um, and when I met him, I, I went along with my best friend to have her wisdom teeth removed uh, because I wanted clinical e experience. Yeah. So I toggled along. And um, I, he wasn't teaching at the university at the time. And I asked her, I said, 
why don't you choose another practitioner that's actually on faculty so that, you know, I can really get immersed in the experience. She said, no, this is, this is where my parents say we need to go. So um, that day was pivotal. That day um, I met a major mentor in my life and I would spend the next six, seven years at his practice as wow. a dental assistant. Um, he uh, was educated. He was a maxillofacial surgeon who went to Penn State. Okay. Um, went back to Syria and founded pretty much the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery there. So um, after, you know, my classes at dental school um, that were all in Arabic, uh, I would go to his practice and um, we'd speak English because he loved, you know, English. And we would, he'd teach me everything. Uh, wow. I would stand, you know, assist him and he would teach me everything in English, show me everything. Um, it was a beautiful relationship and definitely introduced me, you know, to a beautiful bedside manner. I think that was the nicest thing about him was that he was, he had a way with people, you know, yeah. and, and he cared and he was lighthearted and very intelligent. So, um, and knew he believed in me, which was very empowering as a young person. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, it propelled me, you know, to, to keep going and to find my own way. Um, coming over, you know, there are a bunch of exams and I was doing that simultaneously while I also did a pediatric residency in Syria. Oh, you did? Okay. Did. So you actually did some work did. in Syria in yes. a residency program. Oh, yeah. So, and, and I presume that there are residency programs that are probably similar to what we have Very here. similar. Yeah. Yeah. And, um... The head of the pediatric department, um, Dr. Nabih Kurdaji, who has passed as well, but um, also educated in the States, um, up north in Oregon. And um, he was one of the biggest uh, promoters of composites and bonded dentistry and um, brought over a lot of European uh, speakers to uh, introduce, you know, the students to these newer concepts, adhesion dentistry, which now is, you know, commonplace. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was wonderful to be exposed to very worldly and universal concepts. It wasn't just, you know, one particular country. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was very interesting. Um, but when I matched at USC, um, that was a huge moment for me. They hadn't accepted an international applicant for 10 years. Serious? Yeah. Wow. Um, well, and congratulations. You, you. you must have had quite an application. Well, you know, I did graduate first in my class in Syria. Not that the, I wanted to do that only because I felt that was a way to show, you know, who is this person coming from another country who, you know, do they yeah. even know what they're doing? Um, I had to have something to measure against. But I also needed to take um, all the boards that dental sure. students did here, too. Uh, so... There was time spent on that, but there was a lot of passion. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed what I was learning. I enjoyed um, translating everything. It was it was quite a process because everything that I had learned was all there. It was just called something different. <laughs> so yeah, you know, no, making a whole different language. Yeah, That's amazing. Making uh, uh, yeah. that change, and then um, you know, starting the adventure here in California. That was. That was quite something too. I it, new environment. You know, California was new to me. So. Um, yeah, no kidding. I mean, you're talking about going from. I mean, uh, when I think about Damascus, um, it's pretty pretty hot over there, and and you're surrounded by desert, aren't you? Isn't that well? You know, the the climate is actually pretty moderate, and interestingly enough, it is similar to California. Really? Yes, as is Lebanon, which is neighboring, and. So we have the sea, we have the Mediterranean, uh, we have the mountains and snow, and we have the desert. Yeah. So it is, now Damascus itself is inland, but there are cities in Syria that are on the, uh, the Mediterranean. So it, it, very similar climate, similar vegetation. Um, you know, there were similarities, and yet a whole other universe. No, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you decided, okay, now that I, I find it interesting that you actually even wanted to come to the U S mm -hmm. to train. Was that just a matter of just trying to get a more international kind of experience? Yes. Or, yes. Yeah. And also, um, I felt it was, you know, the best experience I sought after, you know, the latest and it, it just, it was 
something that I felt I needed to do. Um, so I did go back after my training and I did start a practice in Syria. Um, I, I worked here first and then I went okay. back. Um, I worked in the UAE. I was a visiting pediatric dentist there, which was another very interesting right. experience. United Arab Emirates, by the way. Yes. <laughs> and then um, I was very much guided to come back to Los Angeles. And I felt that it was time to do that. Um, and I started a, a partnership in life and um, in private practice um, with Marcel Haddad, whom I have two beautiful children with. You, you married this yes, guy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's wonderful. <laughs> and um, yeah, life evolves and, and continues. Yeah. Uh, and I found a home. I really did find a home. So I'm a happy transplant. And and Mar Marcel is he he's happy in California. Wait, was he here in California? Uh, he or? was. Yeah, okay. he's of Lebanese background, and um, you know he uh, um, he really embraced Los Angeles and kind of paved his own path. Um, my family, you know, had hoped that I would stay um, in Syria, but um, I followed my heart, and you know I followed my heart home. And, and as we talked at the beginning of the show, you know, home is where the heart is. It's not a country. It's not a building. Um, it is really um, a deep calling. And yeah. when you know, you know when it's time to move. Um, it was a very surprising move. Um, I've had a few of these in my life where people have no idea what, I, what why and, and, you know, what my plan is, but I'm so clear on it. And you know these moments, Dr. Bob. You've had them, of course, many, many times. <laughs> a couple of you them, know, yeah. you, 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 not, not, a, not a lot of them. I, and sometimes I'm not sure about, I'm, I'm not quite as clear about some of my things I've done. But anyway, here I am. Well, I think you are. I mean, I, I think you're a good example for all of us on Clarity. <laughs> but um, I knew I had to come here. And, um, yeah, it, it, it definitely uh, was where I needed to be. And it's a good place. Um, it, it was the right place for my children to come into the world. Let's yeah. just say that. Yeah. Uh, just uh, this is for free, but I, I do know uh, Reem's beautiful children. And I got to tell you, you're doing a phenomenal job because oh, they are great you. kids. Honestly, <laughs> they both teach of them. me. I think that's really the way it goes. They, they teach me. Uh, I, I am a, an eternal student. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's probably, if you were to ask me what my occupation is, it would really be eternal student. I adore learning and um, I'm returning to USC to teach now and honestly I am learning I am learning Wonderful. again all over again so you're inspiring me Irene. <laughs> okay so friends we are going to take a one minute break here <clears throat> we are talking to Dr. Reem Kabara she's a pediatric dentist here in Los Angeles I do want to talk about dentistry let's do it and uh, but I, I loved your story this is an amazing story so we're going to take a minute, friends. Uh, we're going to come right back. You're listening to The Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Don't go away. The Hamilton Review podcast is brought to you by Hamilton Babies, nine kid-friendly products designed for the little loves in your life. Find them at hamiltonbabies.com or amazon.com. Also consider Dr. Hamilton's recently published book, Seven Secrets of the Newborn, available at Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, and Amazon.com. So, friends, welcome back to the Hamilton Review. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Reem Kabara. She's a dentist, grew up in Syria. She now has a practice on Pico Boulevard here in West LA. So, Reem, I want to get into dentistry. Let's do it. So, <clears throat> let's. Uh, first of all, you you came here. You <laughs> decided to open your practice. Um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts about uh, first of all why you went into pediatric dentistry. And then I want to I want to know a couple things about in terms of your thoughts about when kids should come to the dentist and other mm -hmm. questions like that. So, yeah. pediatric dentistry. Well, um, pediatric dentistry is um, it's a beautiful thing to do. It is uh, you work with families, you work with children. Um, it's fun, you know. It, it's uh, it's an uplifting environment. Our kiddos come in, um, you know, for healthy checkups. Um, at the same time, it is, there's, it's very multifaceted because technically if we are doing, um, any procedures, I mean, these are mini surgical procedures and our, you know, population is a young population. And, um, 
there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. You know, sure. I, I feel that um, comfort is, is really a word that comes to me that is um, high on our responsibility list. Um, ease and, and, and health promoting. Um, those are really at the heart of what our practice does. So our practice is called Smiles Pediatric Dentistry and Orthodontics, and we are a pediatric dental home. Um, offering comprehensive dental care for infants, children, and young adults. Um, I think our teenagers are quickly moving into the young adult population, yeah, Dr. They are. Bob. Don't yeah. you feel that? <laughs> totally. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, so when do you, you know, in terms of kids, when they get their mm -hmm. teeth, first of all, mm -hmm. kids don't get teeth until they're, what, six, seven, eight months of age. Mm -hmm. They start, their teeth start erupting. Mm -hmm. And I, as a pediatrician, I start, I recommend that kid, you know, kids start brushing. The, the mm -hmm. parents brush the teeth of their children yeah, when they yeah. come out. Um, but when should they actually come and see a pediatric dentist? Well, um, you know the, the medical home concept well. <clears throat> um, medical home, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued that in the 90s. And I think the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry followed closely behind in 2001 with the concept of the dental home. Sure. And what that means is having a place that um, holds your hand um, throughout your child's development, and in our case, you know, oral dental development. And that um, really starts at birth. Um, when children should come in, well, those recommendations of the age one dental visit um are what we believe in. And um, it really should be by the time a first tooth is coming into the mouth or yep. no later than age one. That said, there is still a big place to educate expecting mothers um, on how to take care of their own oral health um, and to promote, um, you know, well-being and oral health before their baby comes. Because we know well that, you know, we are hosts to a whole slew of um, microbiome that is in our bodies, in our mouths, in our digestive tract. True. And when baby comes into the world, well, they're introduced to that by us parents, um, you know, starting with the mother and, and the father. We're the closest people to that newborn baby. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, having um, a, a, a fertile um, soil for um, the seed of health is what we aim for. So what do you tell moms who are pregnant about their dental health? Well, you know, that is um, uh, really multifactorial because, and this will, will, will probably be touching upon this uh, during our conversation today about, you know, how we, we form our experiences, right, as we go through life. And um, for those of us working with young children, um, our goal is for them to have positive experiences. Sure. But, you know, they're going to live life and they're going to go through life. And, and, and that is the whole beauty of this universe. You know, we evolve and learn from our experiences. Um, something I brought with me, um, a beautiful something in my practice is hospitality. And, and this comes from my background, you know, where I grew up. Um, and where I grew up, I mean, is in my family home, you know, hospitality, um, welcoming, um, uh, loving the people that are coming in. And, and that's what our practice as a team uh, really believes in. Uh, it's not just the doctors that are taking care of the children. It's, um, you know, our, our wonderful team of um, care coordinators, care providers, and our administrative team. Yep. Um, you know, you're visiting um, as our family. That's really what we, we look towards you as, our family. Um so um, if we were talk to if we were to talk to a mother expecting a baby, I think my questions would be, you know, what would you want for your baby's dental experience, your oral health experience? What would you um, change? You know, um, uh, my dental experience was probably pretty challenging, it, and yet it did promote what I offer today to the children that I see because I would want that changed. Um, sure. I remember those moments and I wanted to create, you know, an environment where kids coming in would actually say, this was awesome. Yeah. This was great. Yet still feel that sense of satisfaction uh, of achievement. You know, there is an achievement, uh, a satisfaction that comes um, when we say, I did that, I did that. And, and, and I'm proud of myself. Yeah. Um, so a pregnant mommy, um, 
wouldn't you want health for your baby? Um, you know, rather than um, concern or fear, you know, maybe we look to how can we make this easy um, and enjoyable? That would be the question. Sure. Yeah. So you, so they, so the kids, so that, that's, that's, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that moms, uh, obviously their health, their, their oral health has got a lot to do with ultimately, uh, you do have a tendency to, to follow after your parents one way or the other, even, even in your, uh, your routines, daily routines, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that we mirror our parents. So the teeth come out, you start brushing them, they come and see you at one year of age. Mm. What uh, and typically children get their full deciduous denti dentition about two and a half years of age. Yeah, is that right? Or probably, or maybe some three, three and a half. Um, okay. The first visit <clears throat> is probably one of our favorite encounters in the practice, um, and this is um, it's a welcoming visit. It's oh. an educational visit, and you know the time spent with the new friend that we're getting to meet. Uh, is not entirely in their mouth. In fact, the, the period of time that we are in their mouth is efficient, effective, and thorough. Um, but what we are doing is talking to the family, understanding their specifics, their individuality, um, really from a place of um, neutrality. I mean, we're, we're, we're not um, uh, in a position to, um, you know, judge or to um, give advice that is black or white. We are actually understanding how can we help this family with yeah. with this promotion of their health that is specific to them, to their background, to how they live life on a daily basis. That is a very broad picture. You know, it, it can differ um, from person to person. Um, but uh, in general, we do like to give our families uh, practical tools. Sure. So, um, you know, one of the things that we really like to do is to explain to families how to go about their daily oral, you know, hygiene routine. When we see um, a, a mommy taking care of her baby and, and feeding her baby, uh, usually we will, we will start to say, get a wet washcloth and just get your baby used to rubbing those gum pads just with something, you know, a little wet washcloth after feeding. Because, you know, we're creatures of habit. And, and once we establish a routine... And you've taught me tons about this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we like routine. Sure. And when that routine is fun and it's done early and it's it's part of what the child expects, it just makes things a lot easier on the family. So you're, you're talking about even taking like a wash rag and, yeah. and, and massaging the gums yeah, of children quick, who don't have teeth. Yes. Just okay. after breastfeeding. That pattern of I clean, I, you know, I, I feed and I clean afterwards. Yeah. Um, and then obviously as the teeth come through, you know, we can start introducing a toothbrush. Yeah. Um, position is a big deal, you know, where to put the baby and how to clean their teeth. And we've, our practice has made videos about that because, you know, you really need to see a picture. Um, toddlers are squirmy and, okay. and many of them, you know, they don't really want you in their mouth, nor do they want you changing their diaper. <laughs> so, right. you know, they have that beautiful new sense of independence that, that, you know, that <laughs> is, uh, Hey, being willful is is, is a good thing no, in life, it, right? It, it you know, spills over into every aspect of their life does. You know, between it's feeding and yes. going to bed and brushing teeth yes. and getting new shoes and getting of a haircut. Course. Anything yes. that you think you can think of that we have to do, they usually uh, give their opinion about it. They do. They do. So you're so you brush teeth. How often do you recommend? I mean, you're talking about twice a day, once yes, a day. Yes, I think twice a day is reasonable. Okay. Um, you know, the two minute brushing it, it may or may not be reasonable. That depends on the child, and and sure. if you can get the teeth clean in a in a, a a very short amount of time, you know that's fine. We're we're aiming to remove plaque off of the the main surfaces. Sure. Um. You know, again, this is individual. Every mouth is a little different because some kids have spaces between their teeth. You know, some toddlers do not have a space between those two top front teeth. And believe it or not, if we're not flossing between there, we're technically leaving plaque and biofilm that could cause issues. So sure. um, there is, um, you know, education um, on the spot showing the parent how, um, giving them a plan and giving them um, some fun ideas. You know, we like to follow the model of um, 
modeling. You know, toddlers are fascinated when they watch their parents do something. And when they, they see their family happy, you know, brushing their teeth to a song, well, guess what? They want to imitate that wanna because we want to, we, you know, want to be like mom and dad. And then in the same sense, um, there is something to be said about empowering them to, to take that upon themselves. So we usually like them to even have a turn you know, and then have mom or dad come afterwards or grandparent, whoever wants to help out. Absolutely. And then, I mean, and, and flossing, now flossing, usually the teeth, you know, my observation of kids, and I see kids all day long, of course, is that there is space between the teeth. So you're not usually, flossing would be True. a little more uh, intense with the young children. Is that your experience? Absolutely. I mean, the more time you're going to be in there, uh, yeah. yes, you're probably going to get some feedback from your little one. But you know, it really does depend on the child. Um, you know, my kids, <laughs> my daughter was so happy to sit there and, you know, let me do whatever. Um, and my son was more opinionated about it. So sure. it, it was uh, fun for me to get, you know, both those experiences and, and understand. And, you know, there are some kids who um, may feel even more strongly about it. My niece uh, has sensory uh, uh, situations where she is not comfortable having somebody in her mouth. So you really have to find... Um, you know, you have to find what works for every child. I think that's that's important, and what works for the parents and the family. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as a as a they grow, they lose their deciduous teeth, and then their permanent teeth come in. Um, you're obviously looking for orth, you know orthodontic uh, orthodontic uh, issues, uh, mm -hmm. and you, I know you do some orthodontia. Mm -hmm. What um, tell us a little bit about maybe some of the the new changes that have actually happened out there in in pediatric dentistry? You mentioned a thing called single tooth anesthesia. This is fascinating to me. Oh, yeah. and so can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, one of the major passions that we have is is really um, being on the cutting edge and following technology and and. Let me just tell you, dental technology has been skyrocketing in the last few years. It is really amazing. Um, and as a practice that strives for comfort, um, we are really, really interested in this stuff. Um, so we want to promote health. That's our, yeah. our first goal. Yep. Uh, but, you know, if we need to help somebody along, then our next, our next goal is to start preventing, you know, uh, issues that can come up. And that can happen with guidance and education. Um, and then if we do need to go in there, we're definitely going to try minimal invasive approaches first. We want to do no harm and keep on promoting health. So technology can help with that. Sure. And and that can be as simple as silver diamine fluoride, which I know you were uh, yeah. asking me about. Um, a simple application of um, a medicament can sometimes, you know, remineralize and help slow down um, a very beginning of a breakdown on the tooth. Okay. Um, and then if we get into treatment modalities, um, again, we're going to be as soft and gentle and um, honoring of these little guys that we work with. So sure. sedation comes into play. You know, we want them having a, a pleasant, comfortable experience. Their safety is our utmost concern. And also having a long-term, you know, view of well, how are they going to be as adults? What is what is this experience that we're offering? How is it going to impact them? That's always, you know, there in the picture, and, and it should be. So um, technology such as the SDA. The SDA system is a single-tooth anesthesia device. It's a computerized pump that um, has a, a very dainty little handpiece uh, that allows delivery of local anesthesia that is more targeted um, and in a gentle way. So the machine has a flow rate to it that pumps in the local anesthetic, which is same as, you know, all of sure. us in the dental profession use and you use, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, the delivery mode is different. And plus it doesn't have, um, the appearance, you know, uh, I know all of us in the, in the medical and the, and the healthcare, um, scene, you know, our instruments, they have certain appearances that aren't appealing to children. <laughs> like, like needles. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and again, that's something people take along with them, you know. So um, how can we educate these little guys about, well, we're, you know, using euphemisms and saying this is what we need to do so that we can, you know, help along this one little tooth. And, and yeah, you know, how can we phrase that in a way that's respectful to them and yet is age appropriate? Sure. And, and honest. Got to be honest. 
got to be honest. Yeah, you got to let them know this is going to probably feel a little uncomfortable or it's going to be, here's what you're going to feel. Yeah. I think if you talk to kids about how the, what you're doing, mm-hmm. and, and generally, I mean, young babies, I don't necessarily talk to them. I feel mm-hmm. odd doing that. <laughs> but when, they're, when kids are older, I certainly tell them what I'm doing because yeah. I think they need to know. They usually kind of figure it out after a while. You don't have to tell them every time. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> they kind of go, they kind of know to open their mouth and yeah, look at me. So yeah. when I do my exams, um, but uh, young kids, you do, you have to kind of guide them. They're like little puppy dogs. You have mm-hmm. to kind of lead them along. Mm-hmm. Um, f- there's one thing I know that uh, there are recommendations about fluoride applications. Mm-hmm. Do you do these kind of fluoride applications and, and do you recommend that routinely for all kids? You know, um, I wouldn't say routinely because again, this is part of a, um, a, an individual family plan. And, um, you know, depending on where one practices and, um, what the family desires are, um, I think we can still find a way to help people out. So, um, the ADA, um, the American Dental Association and the AAPD, which is the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, strongly promote fluoride. Um, but realistically, you know, our practice is in West LA and, um, we have a population that for whatever reason, may have decided they don't wish to incorporate fluoride. So, sure. you know, it's a much <clears throat> softer conversation, um, I found, and you can tell me what you found, um, to go with the flow and find something that will help. Um, because it is ultimately their body, their decision. Um, we can certainly go over the educational factors, the scientific factors, the evidence base. Um, literature factors, sure. but at the end of the day, it is their decision. So there are other ways to promote health other than fluoride. Um, our practice still, you know, offers that, and um, you know, we talk to the families about it. Yeah, I mean, there, there's fluoride. In the, I think the water in Los yes, Angeles. all of our water is fluoridated. A reverse osmosis filtering system will remove it. Yeah, and there are a lot of um, uh, homes that have that. And you know, we still tell our families who may choose not to use fluoride that their kids are getting fluoride. Fluoride is, is um, you know, it, it is um, available in, in our lives, uh, whether we really zero in on it or not. You know, school drinking water. Uh, if you go to a restaurant, well, what are, water are they cooking with? Um, it's naturally occurring in food substances. Um, so it's not like you can eliminate anything 100%, but sure. you may choose not to supplement mm. with it. Yeah. Really the, the, I mean, most of, the, most of the toothpaste also have fluoride yes. in it as well. Yeah, there, there's a lot that is fluoride-free. You will find that depending on where it's purchased, but um, the major companies do. Uh, yeah, uh, they're fluoridated, fluoridated toothpaste. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually, you know, I, I find that the, the children, young children in particular, recoil when you give them like an adult toothpaste because mm-hmm. of the, what my, my grandchildren say is too spicy. Yes. And so your recommendation, do you have any recommendations for children's toothpaste? Uh, sure. I, you know, there are many companies that are coming out uh, that have many flavors. I mean, uh, Tom's of Maine has a strawberry one that kids love. Um, uh, Tanner's Tasty Paste has chocolate and vanilla and there's um a uh, super mouth uh, toothpaste that's come out with uh, all kinds of flavors. And I think, you know, parents come in with a lot of good information. You know, they found something online. They'll ask us, well, what do you think of this? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it really is up to us to kind of say, okay, well, what is this company putting in there? And let's look it up. Let's, let's look at the research behind this. Let's see, you know, what component is in there. Um, there, there are many different products that are promoting other remineralizing substances um, uh, that uh, are, are beneficial. You know, the, the research is, is still on those uh, different uh, uh, additives. Uh, we have uh, MI paste that um, casein is added, phosphate, calcium, um, so many different substances that um, are being looked at now. What, what is MI? I don't know. What MI, MI paste is basically a tooth mousse. It 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 is. Um, it's not a toothpaste. It is a remineralizing agent, if you will. Okay. Um. So you know, if we look at the mouth as um an environment that is very biodynamic, there is a balance that occurs in our mouth. You know, our teeth are not just uh out in space. They're in this beautiful solution called saliva. Yeah. And and most all of our um, attention and research now is focused on this environment of um, uh, and this balance that occurs between you know the microbiome in our mouths and and what it's doing and and um, pH is a big factor as well you know 
that can sure. tip the balance from a healthy um, equilibrium to um, maybe an environment that's promoting demineralization of the enamel and, um, you know, causing some issues in the mouth, which mm. people refer to as cavities. How often do you run into people who truly have enamel issues? I mean, because mm -hmm. they're, they're, I, I have a couple patients in my practice who, who have just multiple caries, mm -hmm. multiple cavities, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they have just what we, I guess, we thin in the enamel or yes. poor enamel. Yes. Um, what, what does that actually mean? Well, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, a better way of looking at it, of course, there are, um, there are situations where there is, um, you know, um, an odontogenic uh, imperfecta situation or right. a, a yeah. enamel hypoplastic in, uh, situation. Yeah. Um, uh, but we, I think the majority of the kids that present are kids that just have this cycle where, you know, you repair one site and then another site breaks down. And the underlying factor here, again, is that balance that we're talking about in the oral environment. Sure. So factors that will promote health and factors that don't. Factors that will cause, you know, the remineralizing of the enamel versus factors that cause demineralizing. So um, w what happens when we eat? Well, we start digestion in our mouth. The pH levels drop. Yeah. So we're in an acidic environment, but our body knows how to come back from that. And we have buffering capacity. Um, but there are other factors at play. There's that whole microbiome that is um, shifting, changing. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a, a thickness to this, this plaque that sits on the teeth. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, uh, change that can happen within this uh, flora depending on what we're eating, how often we're eating. And, and I think that's a key point, how many exposures to, you know, um, substances that may promote that demineralizing process. Yeah. How many exposures? The frequency is a very big factor. So, you know, you cannot eliminate a birthday cake and a celebration and an ice sure. cream from your life. I mean, yeah. that's not realistic, but you might be able to adjust that pattern of feeding, which is really a bigger player in these pH changes in the mouth. The, I mean, the, um, you know, candy, I mean, kids love candy. Of they course. love sweets. They yeah. love, uh, you know, they love ch to chew gum. Yeah. yeah. And I think that uh, when I was a kid, we used to, we, we used to get baseball cards. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they came with a stick of gum. <laughs> I yeah. remember buying, a, I, I got the gum, I got the, I got the baseball cards, yeah. but I also got gum. <clears throat> we chew gum a lot. I'm not sure chewing gum is such a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts about chewing gum that is sugary, you know, sugary gum. Well, you know, I mean, you're going to chew the sugar out of that gum pretty quickly. Um, but how many pieces of gum are you chewing would be, you know, a question. Um, as many and how as I often, can get in my mouth is the yeah. answer to that. <laughs> and how often is probably, again, a bigger uh, yeah. player. And the, um, there are types of gums that have... Um, you know, not just sugar-free. They have actual sugars that are have been shown to promote that health balance. Right. Xylitol being one of them. Right. Um, uh, so there are ways around that. Uh, we like those. You know, we like xylitol-containing products. There has been some research and evidence that um, has shown that it they will um, reduce the harmful bacteria in the mouth. So it's a nice alternative. Um, but I think, you know, we still all want to celebrate and have those good moments. Um, I, I would definitely not want to, you know, sip a sugary drink all day. Um, you know, no matter what the substance is, uh, starting from breast milk, um, to formula, to juice in a bottle, to diluting, um, the juice with a bunch of water at the end of the day, uh, that's still acidic. Um, and, and that's going to cause a pH change. Yeah. So it, uh, having a healthy pattern is a good way to approach things. And, and understanding how this, you know, process happens. And that's a big part of that first dental visit that we were talking about. So a lot of kids, I mean, I, I definitely, you know, kids, my parents ask me all the time, when should I stop a bottle? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I typically tell them that by one year of age, they should begin to limit the availability of a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about these kids? And they, and they look, they, let's be honest, they love to have a bottle before they go to bed, mm -hmm. before they, they, they nap. 
yeah. your, your, your thoughts about that. Because, you know, parents say, well, should I wake my kid up and brush their teeth mm -hmm. after they go to sleep? And I go, well, that kind of defeats the purpose yes. of, of putting. So right. what, do you, what do you think about that? You know, um, it, it was good to have experience on the field with this one, Dr. Bob. You know, I think um, I often wondered, I, I just loved my patients so much when I started practicing. And, and I wondered, I thought, you know, if I become a mother, is that going to take away my attention from, is that going to take some of the love that I have for my patients away from them? Well, I was pleasantly surprised because I found that it actually multiplied it. Sure. And not only that, it, it multiplied my compassion for parents. You know, it, it isn't that something <laughs> Amen you to that. see? Yes, it's true. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, I find that being soft and gentle and understanding, parents, all of us, all humanity means well, um, you know, but we have to take care of ourselves first. You know, we have to be in a good place to be good parents. Um, so if a parent is telling me, you know, I cannot get my child to sleep uh, without giving them a bottle, um, I don't feel I would be a very good health pro proponent or a, a help helpful person to this family to tell them, well, you got to stop that or you're going to cause problems. Um, you know, there are ways around things, uh, a softer way. Um, we've asked families, well, could you dilute that bottle of milk with water over a period of a week or two? Yeah. Um, because here's what we know will happen if these beautiful teeth are soaked in, you know, something sugary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and parents have said, yeah, you know, I can try that. I can do just I add a little more water to the mix and then keep on going. Now, that is not only softer on the parent, that's softer on the baby. Sure. Um, because that's a gradual change, yep. you know, and humans do better with gradual changes when it's gentle and you're you're guiding them. So we found that works. Um, so you basically, you dilute it out to the point they're, they're not having yes, yes. milk anymore. They're having yes. water. The other thing is routine. And establishing an early routine is kinder on the family. That doesn't mean that, you know, if it didn't happen at age six months, they're, they've missed the boat. You know, we can we can talk about that and find another way for them. But ideally, if we've gotten that baby used to cleansing their gum pads, and then, you know, after they feed, well, this is planting a seed of, of, of a pattern that's going to promote their health. And, you know, after that bottle, they might be able to brush their teeth if they're still, you know, getting a nighttime feed. Um, even if a mother is breastfeeding, um, just wiping down the teeth with a wet washcloth is going to be beneficial. It doesn't mean that, you know, there's there's no other way than getting a, a toothbrush with toothpaste on there and, and, and going to town and disrupting the whole sleep pattern of the family. Yeah, so no, this is individual, <clears throat> and it really depends yeah. on... Um, what works for the parents and what works for the baby. It is not a one-size-fits-all. Yeah. No, I think you have to have a little creativity with mm -hmm. each of your children. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, uh, I'm, we're, I'm watching our time here, yes. and this has been a fascinating conversation, but I, I want to kind of finish up with uh, something that you, a word that you taught me when you came in yes. uh, today before we started recording, which is salutogenesis. And I, 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 I'm fascinated by, first of all, by the word mm -hmm. and also um, why you actually brought that up. So can, as we finish off today, yes. uh, Dr. Kabara, can you tell us about salutogenesis? Well, I think, um, you know, it, it really was a paradigm shift for me as a, as a healthcare practitioner to honor health. You know, we're taught at school to always analyze everything and look at this problem. And, you know, as we're learning, we're, we're fascinated by, you know, how something presents. I think we would really enjoy focusing on the amazing apparatuses that are called our bodies and the capacity for healing and for health um, is just mind boggling. I think um, when I came across this concept, it was, um, a recent publication in the AAPD, um, which is the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, uh, one of their journals. Um, and it means the promotion of health. It was um, coined by a medical sociologist um, by the name of, uh, let's see, Aaron, uh, or I'm sorry, I want to get his name right because the concept was so fascinating. Um, yes, Aaron An An Antonovsky, Aaron Antonovsky. Um, but it means to go back to the origins of health. Yeah. And it's Latin and Greek, but it means go back to the origins of health. 
Um, and that requires um, a mind shift. It requires honoring ourselves. It requires paying attention to what would promote our health and what and and also having a trust in our ability to be healthy. I think um, that was really what fascinated me about this uh, concept. So working with infants and, you know, as they grow, um, I think that's a good goal to promote <laughs> health. Sure is. Yeah. No, I think that was one of the things that, that drew me to the pediatric practice was the fact that um, – you can you can have a uh, you can have a um, a role in shaping the course of the life when you're as as you're working with children. You as a pediatric dentist, me as a pediatrician, we can you know help to guide them. We can help kind of nudge them along yes. in, a, in a positive way. And certainly, I will tell you, you have done that in your profession. I I know patients who come to you. A ream, and they love you, wow. uh, and that so My that pleasure. home that that warm home that you're talking about that hospitality is very very evident in in uh, certainly the people that uh, have gone to your practice. So congratulations. So be, before we finish, I do want to know how do how I want people to know how do people find you? Uh, well, we're the yellow building on uh, Pico Boulevard. <laughs> okay. We we um, <clears throat> so uh, West LA. Yes, uh, yeah. smilesla.com is our website. Um, you'll see our latest passions of, um, laser or our magic light, which, um, is a whole other topic. You'll see our passion of, um, 3D dentistry, digital dentistry, 3D printing, which is a whole other adventure. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, promote health, uh, in our daily practices. Um, but it's been a pleasure. And it's great. It's yeah, been an honor no, you're you're on the cutting edge, dear. You're you're doing a lot of cool things. So yes, it's it's fun. So Smiles Dentistry West uh, West uh, LA on Pico Boulevard. It's a pretty cool place. And uh, Dr. Kabara, you have been such a pleasure to, to speak with today. Thank you for Pleasure's taking the mine. time, Thank taking you. the time to come over here actually to the studio and record together. Thank so, you, Dr. Bob. So friends, we have been having a great conversation today with Reem uh, Kabara. She's a pediatric dentist from Peak, uh, on Pico Boulevard. Smiles, uh, Smiles Pediatrics is the name of her dentistry office. And Reem, thanks again for coming over. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. It's been a pleasure. And friends, thanks for tuning in. Until next time, be well. Bye-bye. You have been listening to The Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.